thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to start off, ask you about your um, personal story for the first question. Uh, I read that you went to school in Paris, studied uh, law and political science. So can you tell me about that and uh, what made you join um, Foreign Affairs? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I am a diplomat. Uh, this is my, my job. This is my career. This is my life. Um, professional life, but it has also implications for, for my family. Uh, but I am the first diplomat in my family. Uh, my, my parents were teachers in public schools, in a, in a high school in, in France. And uh, uh, my, uh, uh, the dreams that I had when I was a, a, a child uh, had nothing to do with diplomacy because I, I didn't know what it was. Um, I just knew the words without really knowing the, the meaning. But I certainly dreamt of uh, traveling. I uh, was, uh, was very much uh, attracted by uh, the, um, the idea of traveling, of getting to know uh, uh, different uh, people, different cultures, visit different continents. And it's, uh, it's probably one of the reasons why, without having the project of being a diplomat, but one of the reasons why at school I was uh, better in history and geography than in science. Uh, and so after my baccalaureate at the end of my um, secondary uh, school uh, education, uh, I, I, I passed the um, concours, the examination to, uh, to go to a, a school called Sciences Po in, in Paris. This is the Institut d'études politiques. Uh, I realized later that at Sciences Po you do everything with two exceptions, no science, and, and no science, no political science. I, I, there I studied law, economics, uh, international relations, a little bit of uh, English, German, um, uh, macroeconomy, but no political science. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about, uh, it's about uh, being prepared to become a public servant, to work in the, for, for the government, the national government or the local government. And of course, a number of my, uh, my colleagues and friends at that time also joined the, the private sector after, after Sciences Po. Uh, but it was in the course of my studies that I, uh, I realized that I wanted really to, to do something international. And uh, of course, I was aware of a place called the Quai d'Orsay, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I, I was not sure it was for me, um, but I, I, I did try my chance. And, uh, and in the end, it worked. And, and here I am. And I saw also that you, yes, you, you worked for uh, sort of, you were the um, representative for uh, like the counselor of uh, African affairs where you learned Swahili. So um, can you tell us uh, what made, uh, how did that opportunity arise? Among the places that I was uh, more and more attracted into uh, or the, the areas in the world, um, Africa had always had a special place for, for some reason. Some of them I know, some of them I don't. You know, it's like you're being a child, you see a movie, you hear a song, there's something that, that connects you. And uh, um, for some reasons, I was more, in, more attracted by non-French speaking Africa, uh, which could be uh, in a way kind of paradox because France has very strong relations, but more with West Africa, Central Africa. But the Africa that made me dream as a, as a child and later as a, as a boy and a young adult was more the country of, um, of uh, um, uh, some, some, some movies I had seen like out of Africa, like uh, the countries of the safaris. I, I'm not a hunter, but I, but I, I like, 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 like billions of, uh, of, of people on this planet we dream of, uh, you know, visiting Serengeti and Gorongoro, these kind of places. Uh, and, and, and I, uh, I made a little bit of research and I, it did not take me too long to realize that it was, this part of Africa was not only the, uh, the origin of humanity, not only the origin of uh, some of the most uh, uh, gorgeous places you can, you can dream of, if you like uh, outdoors and nature, but also 
the uh, cradle of a language called Swahili, which is a very interesting language because it's, a, it's an African language, it's a Bantu language with a Bantu structure, but with uh, many, many words imported, if you will, uh, from uh, other parts of the world, uh, Arabic and the uh, Arabic Peninsula in particular, but also India, Iran, Europe, Portugal, France, um, uh, uh, Great Britain. So Swahili is a, is a very rich language. And on top of that, it is a language that is uh, spoken by uh, uh, thousands of um, uh, uh, millions of, uh, of, of speakers in Africa. Uh, actually, more than 100, uh, 100 million uh, people speak Swahili as their first or second languages. It is an international language. Um, and it's, um, to me, it is, um, it is an illustration uh, that uh, Africa is a, is a continent that is seeking its unity, its unity. It's, it, it's seeking it, it, uh, the place it deserves on the on, 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 in, on the planet and uh, needs to be uh, recognized as a, as a continent, as a countries, as peoples um, uh, to be reckoned with. And if they don't, they, of course, it's, wonder, it's wonderful that in Africa, many, many people speak several languages, unlike, uh, unlike here, unlike in France. Um, but I think it's good for, for them to also have their own languages. Of course, French, and we will get to that later, I'm sure, in the conversation. It's a language not for one country, not just for one continent. But I think it's terrific as well to see uh, uh, outsiders learn Swahili, like it is terrific to see Africans uh, learn uh, European languages. It should, it should always go both ways. And I'm trying to, to be an example of that. Awesome. Was it very difficult to learn Swahili? It is, uh, it is difficult in the beginning. It is a language that is... Uh, that is a very regular language. Uh, to me, it is a kind of, uh, of African German. It's, uh, it's very regular. It has very strict uh, grammar rules. And in the beginning, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, um, not confusing because there is a logic, but it's, uh, it's a bit challenging. But if, like in any language, you need to practice, practice, practice. And after, uh, after months or years, you feel, uh, you feel more comfortable. And, and, and then you start to make real progress. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, would you like to say um, in Swahili uh, what you like about um, working in Africa, maybe? Ani napenda sana kufanya kazi Africa, barani Africa. Kwa sababu watu wa Africa ni watu ambao wana fanya kazi nzuri, wana moyo nzuri sana, na Wanapenda kusafiri kama mimi. Awesome. Very cool. Trilingual or more? <laughs> uh, Swahili, English, and, and now I'm, I'm trying to, to catch up a little bit with German, which I started to learn at a very young age, but I, I kind of dropped it 30 years ago, and now I'm trying to, to get back a little bit. Super. Now I want to talk about the consulate as a whole in Chicago in the Midwest. So um, not only are you in Chicago, you control many states, right? <laughs> I, I control, why not? Yes. <laughs> but it, it, it is true that the consulate, in, the consulate general in, in Chicago has, a, has a, a pretty vast jurisdiction that is uh, composed of 13, one, three states. And that is uh, in, 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 um, in terms of number of uh, uh, states involved the largest consulate in a uh, French consulate in, in, in the United States, uh, not by the number of French citizens. I think we come three or fourth, but by the number of states, we are number one. And we are very proud of that. <laughs> and there's many, uh, many workers there. How many workers work at the consul? It About 15, 15 workers. Um, either doing consular stuff, that is serving the French community, the French citizens, passports and IDs. Um, we have a, a, a cultural and education department. We have a scientific department. And uh, we also have colleagues who work with the French government agency called Business France. Uh, 
and I, I don't include them in the 15. So they are additional 15. So we, we're about, uh, about 30, uh, a little more than 30, a little less than 30 these days uh, in the office. Very cool. Um, so what are the, um, a, as you know, we have a consulate in uh, New Orleans and um, it's, they do a lot of cultural uh, initiatives. Um, however, not so much with um, sort of the consular affairs like visas, passport, they, I don't believe they do that. So um, I, I believe you do. So can you tell me what the, if you could summarize, uh, what, what are the main uh, objectives of uh, your consulate? I, I would say that we have, uh, we have two, two big objectives and two main objectives. Number one, is, uh, is about uh, the French citizens. Um, by that, I mean the uh, persons who have a French citizenship as their uh, sole citizenship or one of their citizenships. And uh, we evaluate the number of uh, children included uh, uh, in, in, in the jurisdiction of the consulate uh, at uh, 20, 25,000 French people. French persons living in the Midwest, uh, about 40% uh, of that is registered with the consulate. The largest community uh, that live in the Midwest is in the Chicago area in Illinois. But this is not, uh, this is the largest uh, number, but we have uh, very um, important communities outside Chicago. And that is maybe a difference with a uh, with, um, with, with uh, my colleagues in New Orleans or even in New York or in Miami, where they have by far the largest number in the city where they live. Here it is different because it's a bit split between Chicago, but also Detroit, or I should say Detroit, <laughs> uh, oui. uh, Des Moines, <laughs> Minneapolis, Saint Paul, oui. uh, Saint Louis, all French names, by the way. Huh? Louisville, <laughs> Indianapolis, and Kansas City, and, and, and so on and, and so forth. And so that's number one. We provide them with a, a number of, uh, of services that they, they require uh, to re renew their passports, uh, their carte d'identité. Uh, we make sure that they can vote in French elections. Uh, if someone has got a problem uh, being arrested, for example, we, we don't provide a, attorney services, but we provide what we call um, counselor assistance. We make sure that that person has a, an access to, to his or her family back in France. Uh, we can provide some, some advice and also do some form of liaison with the police or the justice here. Um, of course, it is not about making this person uh, uh, protected uh, in the sense that there is no uh, criminal accountability, of course, there is criminal accountability. We, we just make sure that uh, that person does, does, does enjoy the same rights as anyone. Um, and the second objective is really about uh, the French, not, not the French government, the French people, the French as a country, the French as a, as a culture, being um, a, a partner of, uh, of the Midwest, of the cities, of the counties, of the states, of the communities, uh, political partner, security partner, cultural partner, education partner, scientific partner, and of course business partner. So anything that is, uh, that is, that is French in the Midwest in some way, uh, sometimes in, uh, in, in, in large, to a large extent, sometimes to a very minimal extent, has, has, has something to do with me. And basically in that context, I represent uh, France, the French government, the French people, in any capacity here under the, 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 the authority of the French ambassador in, uh, in Washington. And it's also about promoting connections between uh, the communities in the Midwest and France. It's not only about Paris and New York or even Paris and Chicago. It's about, uh, um, it's about uh, Le Havre, and, 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 and Kansas City maybe, or Rouen and Cleveland. These are Rouen and Cleveland, for example, are sister cities. It's about uh, 
um, the universities in Aix Marseille or in Toulouse or in Grenoble. Um, and uh, likewise, it is about uh, promoting uh, France as a destination for investment coming from American companies. It's about promoting France as a destination for study abroad programs. We want to attract more students from America to France. And again, not only the students from the two coasts or maybe from Louisiana, because there is a, a, a very uh, established uh, historic connections. We want to attract more students from Iowa, from uh, downstate Illinois, from uh, uh, South Dakota to France. And uh, to have more Americans looking favorably, if possible, uh, uh, toward France uh, with um, uh, a sense of alliance, friendship, but also with a realiz realization that France is not only the country of wine and cheese, uh, which we are and we are very proud of, <laughs> but we are also a country of uh, science, of innovation, of, uh, of business, of uh, uh, very uh, respected uh, uh, army uh, in, 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 in Europe and, and, and elsewhere. And uh, the good news is that you can do wine and cheese and science at the same time. It, there is no contradiction. That's, that's, uh, that's why we're trying to demonstrate. Fantastic. Um, there is also, um, since we're talking about uh, the areas like Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, I learned today actually that there is um, a dialect of French, um, Français du Missouri, or yeah. Papa France, yes. <laughs> Papa French. And uh, it's funny because uh, in Louisiana, we call our grandparents Papa, Papa and Momo. <laughs> so um, are you familiar with this dialect? And if so, please tell me uh, more. Unfortunately, I can speak Swahili and I cannot speak Popo French. <laughs> but yes, I'm familiar with it. Um, it, is a, it is a story that is, a, that is not told, unfortunately, neither in the United States nor in France. In France, nobody knows about um, the very, uh, very strong footprint uh, that did exist and, and still exist to some extent in this part of, uh, of America. Back in France, when people think uh, about uh, uh, French uh, uh, footprints in, the, in, the, in America, they think, uh, they think Quebec and they think New Orleans, which is fine. In both cases, this is, this is very true. At the same time, uh, the area that I cover here in my capacity of Consul General used to be uh, Louisiana as well. If you wow. look at maps of the early 18th century, you will see the very name Louisiana, not where you are, <laughs> but where I am here, right in the middle of America. And that used to be Louisiana. Um, if you look at the map of um, Wisconsin, uh, a little bit uh, 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 north of, uh, of the lake here, if you uh, try to, uh, uh, to, to erase the the native American names and the French names from the map. You know, like the Milwaukee, the Prairie du Chien, and, uh, and Fond du Lac. Right. What remains? Basically nothing. You find maybe Green Bay and that's it. <laughs> Madison. So that tells a lot about the history here. Uh, but not just an history that belongs to the past. It's about also the present and the future. There are many, many uh, connections between the population here and, and their French ancestry. Uh, it is interesting to see that the people who, who try, you know, the ancestry.com DNA testing realize that they are more French than they think. And, uh, and when you ask them, does it make a difference to realize that you are maybe 20% French? And the answer is always, yes, it does matter. I'm very proud of that. I didn't know. Uh, and some, some, some other people know in Michigan, in Minnesota and elsewhere. Um, what is uh, a bit sad in a way is that uh, the French language has kind of uh, disappeared. Sometimes for logical reasons, it's, uh, it's about history, it's about majority versus minority, it's about integration, it's about the melting pot, which I think is very good. At the same time, it is, uh, I think, uh, um, 
uh, regrettable to see that uh, the communities that did exist and that still use the French or French dialects just two or three generations ago have, uh, have disappeared culturally. And I commend you uh, and other organizations to make sure that this heritage in the Midwest is not lost. And it's not only uh, uh, a matter of, of, of protection, of preservation. It is a matter also of education and, and sharing this heritage, which is uh, an asset that uh, you Americans should, should, should take advantage of. So I have visited um, all mines in Missouri. That is a, it's very, it's, it's not even a small town, it's a village. But in all mines, La Vieille Mine, La Vieille Mine Renault, uh, you can still find um, a very, a very, 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 very few number of, uh, of persons, uh, maybe, maybe four or five, as I understand. But I remember meeting Miss Natalie, Miss Natalie, is a, is a distinguished uh, um, uh, old lady who can still sing in French and can understand a little bit French, the French that was spoken by her parents and grandparents back in time. But she told me that when she went to school, she had to, she had to drop French because there were, there were too few French speakers. And um, I think it's not uh, insulting as well to say that at that time speaking French was not consider that being very, uh, very good. So she had, she had no choice. And it is unfortunate that we, including we the French, my predecessors, we let this not die, but, but, but almost disappear. We should not do that. I think what, what, whatever connects this region with France is good for France, but I think it's good for the region as well, because uh, it's not about speaking uh, one additional language. It's, uh, it's about recognizing all the different uh, origins that, 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 that make what, what America is today. Uh, maybe the French communities were, were um, uh, in terms of numbers, where they were too weak. Um, and that's fine, that's, that's history. Uh, there has been a lot of intermarriages and that's fine. And I think I take pride as a representative of the French government and French people in seeing that uh, the French American communities, the first European communities here in this part of America, were the first to merge into the melting pot. And that's, that's very good. And that's to the credit of the ancestors we are, we are talking of. But at the same time, it, should be, it would be silly to, to just drop this heritage. I think that's, a, that's an additional, that's a plus, that's not a minus. Super. I agree, definitely. Um, nice. Um, so uh, your experience working in America in comparison to France is uh, different, but uh, good, like you say, because you get to acknowledge the, that uh, although you are in America, you know, fr France is with you a little bit too anywhere in here, you know, like New Orleans, Chicago. So um, very cool. Um, now I'd like to talk about um, why learning French for young students um, in America specifically uh, is a good idea. And um, you can speak in français s'il vous plaît, if you want to. En français maintenant ou après? Oui, oui, bien sûr. Moi, j'aime partager mes expériences et c'était d'ailleurs le sens de votre, vos premières questions. Moi, je suis français, j'ai grandi dans une, dans, à la campagne en France, loin des grandes villes, et d'apprendre l'anglais à l'école, euh, d'apprendre l'allemand, ça m'a sorti, ça m'a permis de, de, de m'évader et d'avoir envie de, de voyager. Et puis plus tard, j'ai appris le Swahili euh, à l'âge de 20 ans. Bien, ce que j'ai vécu et ce qui m'a permis de, de trouver mon chemin à travers les langues, eh j'aimerais ai, bien que, que des que des jeunes Américains et des jeunes Américaines aient la même expérience, et il y en a beaucoup qui l'ont naturellement, euh, en, en apprenant le français. Et je rencontre tous les jours, euh, de tous les âges, des Américains qui ont appris le français, souvent jeunes, mais parfois un âge plus élevé, et, 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 et ont considéré que ça a été pour eux quelque chose qui changeait un petit peu leur vie et leur façon de voir le monde. Pourquoi Ce n'est pas que le français est mieux que d'autres langues, c'est le fait d'apprendre des langues étrangères qui vous conduit à découvrir, 
à mieux comprendre ce qui se passe dans le monde et aussi être plus tolérant et plus à l'écoute. Quand vous apprenez une langue étrangère, au début, vous êtes à l'écoute tout le temps, vous n'avez pas le choix puisque vous ne pouvez pas parler. Et c'est un vrai apprentissage de la vie. Ça vous apprend peut-être à devenir diplomate. Un bon diplomate, je pense que c'est quelqu'un qui écoute. Mais ça vous apprend aussi à devenir un bon manager, parce qu'un bon manager, c'est quelqu'un qui écoute, quelqu'un qui s'adapte aux autres, quelqu'un qui prend en compte les différences humaines, y compris les différences culturelles. Et c'est ça que je voudrais dire, c'est qu'à euh, travers ces petits exemples qui sont des exemples de l'apprentissage de la vie, en réalité, ça, ça vaut aussi pour la vie économique. Trop souvent, on entend dire que euh, pour trouver du travail, il faut choisir les langues euh, du commerce, les langues de l'avenir. Et donc en France, euh, pendant très longtemps, et on continue de le dire, c'est l'anglais, c'est tout, il n'y a pas d'autre chose. C'est dommage, on peut aussi apprendre l'allemand, on peut apprendre le swahili, on peut apprendre l'espagnol, on peut apprendre le néerlandais, on peut apprendre le russe, on peut apprendre évidemment le chinois. Aujourd'hui aux États-Unis, c'est un peu comme si euh, l'enseignement du français était comme l'enseignement de l'allemand en France il y a quelques années. On dit mais c'est bien, mais... Ça ne sert à rien. C'est sympathique, mais ça ne sert à rien. Ça ne sert à rien parce que vous ne pouvez pas... Bien sûr, vous pouvez faire du commerce, mais ça n'a rien à voir avec le mandarin. Alors d'abord, il faudrait faire la différence entre le mandarin et le cantonais parce que les gens qui en parlent souvent, ils ne savent pas de quoi ils parlent. Ça, ça fait une différence avec le, euh, peut-être l'hindi, euh, l'espagnol. Tout ça, c'est très bien. Moi, je, je n'oppose pas une langue contre une autre. Je dis au contraire que l'Amérique parle trop anglais. <rire> et l'Amérique doit apprendre... À, à les langues étrangères pas pour euh, concurrencer l'anglais l'anglais est évidemment la langue de l'Amérique et des états unis c'est très bien comme ça au Canada on parle plusieurs langues mais aux états unis on parle une langue, parfait mais ça n'empêche pas d'apprendre des langues étrangères parce que dans le monde dans lequel nous vivons la planète est de plus en plus petite c'est mieux de connaître les langues étrangères et si euh, les Américains euh, font l'erreur de ne pas investir dans l'enseignement des langues étrangères ils font une grave erreur ils font une grave erreur parce que le reste du monde parle plusieurs langues. Soit parce qu'on est dans des pays où on a besoin d'apprendre l'anglais, on a besoin d'apprendre d'autres langues. Euh, et c'est le cas de la Chine, c'est le cas, les Chinois apprennent l'anglais, les Indiens apprennent l'anglais, les Français apprennent l'anglais, les Africains parlent plusieurs langues. Donc vous serez les seuls à parler une seule langue. Et vous allez perdre, des, vous allez perdre de l'influence. Donc c'est dans votre intérêt. Ensuite, le français présente par rapport à d'autres langues euh, un avantage unique, c'est que c'est la seule langue avec l'anglais qui est parlée sur tous les continents. Il y a sur tous les continents des pays où on parle français, soit parce que c'est la langue officielle, soit parce que c'est une langue administrative, une langue du travail, ou alors ou soit parce que c'est, c'est un pays où, on, où il y a beaucoup de gens qui parlent le français. Et on parlait de l'Afrique tout à l'heure, les grands pays africains qui ne parlent pas français euh, comme langue officielle, font un effort massif d'enseignement du français. Au Nigeria, au Ghana, en Afrique du Sud, en Tanzanie, au Kenya, en Éthiopie, dans tous ces pays, on reconnaît l'importance du français. Et si vous êtes nigérian, vous savez que si vous apprenez le français, vous pouvez parler avec tous les voisins. Et quand je dis ça, ce n'est pas une situation de langue coloniale. Le français est une langue qui appartient à tous les francophones. Ce n'est pas une langue qui appartient dirait, d'abord aux Français et ensuite à d'autres peuples. Cette langue, elle appartient à tous les peuples. Et je vais même plus loin. Elle a tous les peuples qui parlent français. Elle appartient à toutes les personnes qui parlent le français. Et donc ici, aux États-Unis, pour moi, il y a euh, euh, suffisamment de locuteurs de français pour considérer que les États-Unis sont aussi un pays francophone. Bien sûr, ça n'est pas, un, ça n'est pas une langue officielle. C'est vrai que la Louisiane, maintenant, est un pays... Euh, est un état observateur de la francophonie et c'est formidable. Et peut-être qu'un jour, le Missouri aussi le saura, on ne sait jamais. Mais surtout, dans la mesure où il y a aux États-Unis des millions de gens qui soit parlent le français par héritage ou qui parlent le français par choix, eh bien, les États-Unis font aussi partie de la famille francophone. L'espace francophone n'a pas de frontières, il n'a pas de limites. Tous les endroits où on parle le français font partie de la famille. Et, et donc, cette cette situation qui fait que cette langue est non seulement parlée sur tous les continents, mais qu'elle est extrêmement accueillante, inclusive et parfaitement égalitaire, je trouve que c'est un avantage énorme 
qui, euh, qui n'est peut-être pas suffisamment euh, mis en valeur. Et moi, la, la, la vision que j'ai du, du, du plurilinguisme, et en particulier de la question de la langue française, ça n'est pas du tout, une, enfin, en tout cas je l'espère, une, une vision qui soit tournée vers le passé, vers la défense du petit carré français francophone. Au contraire, je pense que c'est parfaitement en phase avec le mouvement de mondialisation, mais une mondialisation équilibrée, juste, égalitaire que nous souhaitons. Super, génial. Um, great. Um, another question. Uh, I ask all the American diplomats in France to describe uh, why they should visit their city. For example, I asked the Consul General in Marseille, what is there to do in Marseille? I asked the Consul in Bordeaux, what is there to do in Bordeaux? So I want to ask you, um, suivant, uh, pour de, tous les visiteurs euh, aux États-Unis, euh, pourquoi visiter Chicago Chicago est, est le cœur de l'Amérique. Et quand je dis le cœur, ça n'est pas seulement le centre, c'est le cœur, ici, là. <rire> C'est-à-dire que c'est une ville qui, qui a une pulsation cardiaque très forte. C'est une ville qui a beaucoup de caractère et qui, à mon sens, avec Détroit, sont les deux villes qui représentent le plus cette histoire américaine absolument formidable. Une histoire très dense, parce que la timeline n'est pas très étirée, en termes en tout cas d'urbanisation. Euh, mais tout ce que l'Amérique a réussi se trouve à Chicago. Tout ce que l'Amérique a moins bien réussi se trouve aussi à Chicago. Et euh, c'est une ville où on, où on vit très fort le jour et la nuit. Euh, c'est une ville où on est très fier d'être de, de Chicago. Moi, je suis juste de passage, mais j'ai toujours été très bien accueilli. Peut-être que le consul américain à Bordeaux euh, a parlé du vin de Bordeaux. Alors, je ne pourrais pas parler du vin de Chicago. Il euh, y a du vin dans le Midwest, mais bon, euh, c'est pas mal dans le Michigan, pas mal. Et, et puis, il y en a un petit peu ailleurs. Mais par contre, les bières à Chicago sont absolument délicieuses. Et sont bien meilleurs qu'en France. Il faut être, euh, il faut être honnête. <laughs> Fantastique. Um, ok. I have um, two questions left in English. Um, I also like to ask diplomats, um, as the head consul, um, the consul general, um, I ask typically who are some uh, famous. French politicians that you have welcomed to your station. I saw in uh, this year, you, uh, the French ambassador came. Uh, so are there any notable um, people that came from France to Chicago when you were here? Yes, and I, I actually we would like to, to receive more. And the problem is Um, it's difficult to, uh, to have people visiting in the middle of the winter in Chicago oh. uh, for, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and, and, and the middle in the winter in Chicago maybe is in March because you have April, May, uh, sometimes June when you feel cold. So from, from October through, through May, it's, it's the winter. Uh, but the, the real challenge that we sometimes face is that In, in France and with very French eyes, uh, uh, kind of projecting the centralized vision that we have from our country, which I think is, is too much, is that uh, there is a, a, a precon preconceived idea that if you want to visit America, you should go to New York, Boston maybe, or Washington, or West Coast. Uh, yes. Uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, maybe Seattle, uh, which are all wonderful places to visit, but the kind of, you know, the, the flyover country um, uh, uh, prejudice or, or complex uh, also, uh, unfortunately, is, is, is a true thing with a French visitor. So we like to, to have more. But among the, the, the VIPs that I have received, uh, if I... Uh, do it in the chronological order. Uh, 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 and, I, and I'm very proud of that, a number of women. Women tend to visit more 
for some reasons that I don't know, Chicago than men. Uh, I received uh, Madame Christiane Taubira, who was our Minister of Justice not, not too, too long ago. Uh, Madame Christiane Taubira is a very prominent, uh, 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 not, not, just not, not just politician in France, but she's a state, state, stateswoman. Um, she is um, uh, originally from French Guiana. Uh, and she, um, she uh, among uh, uh, many achievements, uh, was the, um, the French justice minister who, uh, who oversaw the passage of the same-sex marriage in France. And this was, this was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, controversial at the time, but she, uh, she, she held very, very strong to her position. And even the, the, um, the uh, uh, political representatives who... Who, who, who did not share uh, her, uh, her um, uh, position and, and her fight did recognize that she she was a, she was a very uh, a very fair uh, contender and a very respectful person. So we received uh, Madame Christiane Taubira. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Mayor um, Anne Hidalgo of Paris, who came to um, participate to uh, climate meeting, uh, the so-called C40 at the invitation of the previous mayor of uh, Chicago, uh, Ram Emanuel. Um, and uh, last year we had the visit of Madame Ségolène Royal, uh, who, who used to be the, um, the Minister of, uh, of uh, Environment and, uh, and Climate at the time of the uh, Paris uh, Climate Accord. And she came to visit Chicago and had meetings uh, uh, in several uh, with several institutions, including the, the University of, of Chicago. Great, awesome. Um, yes, I think it's a beautiful city. I've never been, but the pictures look great. And I think, yes, many people should go because um, it's not too far from, you know, not too far flight from New York or something like this. So, you know, I think it's a good idea for people coming into America. Um, okay, my final question um, is gonna be, uh, so far uh, in Chicago, uh, what are some proud moments you've had? And uh, what would you like to do? One thing you'd like to do looking onward that will make you proud? The things that make me, me proud, I, I believe, is um, number one is uh, the, uh, the great honor and opportunity to, to be the uh, official presenting World War II veterans uh, with the French Medal of the Legion of Honor. In my capacity of Consul General, I, I have the um, authority uh, and more importantly, the duty to um, express my nation's gratitude to uh, uh, the last uh, representatives of American greatest generation. Uh, boys, sometimes girls, but uh, a majority of boys uh, born and raised in the Midwest uh, had a very uh, challenging uh, uh, time during uh, the Great Depression and uh, who at the age of uh, 17, 18 joined, uh, joined the US Army, the Air Force, the Navy to, uh, to, to serve their country in uniform. But in, in doing so, in serving their country with honor, courage, selflessness, they not only served America, they saved France. And that is, um, that is uh, 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 um, a depth that uh, we have and that we will, uh, we the French people, uh, we the Europeans as a whole, we will never be able to repay in full. But my country, France, feels very, very, very connected with uh, America's greatest generation and, and through them to, uh, to America as a whole. Um, we play the role in the helping George Washington and the Patriots and help America become independent. We take a lot of pride in being uh, America's oldest ally. But we also uh, recognize that what you did for us is go so much beyond just, uh, just repaying your debt. Uh, we owe you, we owe you. And it is, uh, it is something that, that makes me proud. And I'm, I'm sure all my colleagues here in the United States who are consuls or 
uh, of the ambassador are very proud of being able to say thank you. Thank you to World War II veterans and through them, um, America. The other thing that makes me proud, it, it is uh, something that I'm not able to see now, but hopefully in the years to come, and to see that uh, at some point, maybe uh, our communication, our words, our action uh, made a difference in, uh, in somebody's life, in the sense that maybe at some of the uh, uh, activities that we collectively have, uh, have done or a talk that I have given, May, may have uh, uh, planted a seed in, uh, in a young person's mind uh, about uh, um, being interested in, uh, in French culture, in the Francophone world, uh, study in France. And, uh, and, I, and I, I hope at, at some, some point in time, in the coming years, I, will, I, I, I would see the, what the seed has, uh, has, has become. And that is, uh, I think, one of the uh, very, um, very um, rewarding aspect of our job is, is that uh, we work for the future, uh, maybe even more than the embassy. The consulates are in the present very much focusing on the, the services to the French community, but they also work with American and um, French American partners in education, in science, in culture. And all these fields, of course, it takes years and years to yield fruits. And, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some of, some of these fruits because we believe that the partnerships, the connections between France and America uh, is not always, but in, in, uh, in, 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 in most of the cases, a very, very fruitful partnership. And it is our common interest to, to work together because uh, we, we, should, we have so much in common and we trust in each other which is, I think, the most important uh, asset. It's, it's confidence, it's, it's the capacity to trust and say, okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's do a crazy thing. And we will see at the end of the road uh, how, how successful we will be, because we know that we will be successful. Uh, but to, to what extent it, it remains to, uh, to be seen. Uh, the thing that I would like to, to, to uh, advance a little more, this is going to be my last year as a, as a council here, is that uh, uh, I think on, when it comes to business, when it comes to culture, when it comes to education, we have the existing uh, 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 formats, existing partnerships, existing uh, um, spaces of cooperation. But when it comes to uh, uh, medical cooperation, I think we could achieve more. And I would like to focus more on the on the healthcare, on, uh, on um, uh, medical research, not me, huh? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also uh, on, on pharma. Here in the Midwest, we are very uh, lucky because we have the number one and number two medical institution in the United States, but also in the world, the Mayo Clinic in, uh, in Minnesota, the Cleveland Clinic is, is, a, is a very renowned institution. There are some existing connections, but I think we can do more. And this is going to be my, uh, the, my, one of my priorities in the, in the, in the coming months is to, uh, to, to help create, create more connections, more synergies. Uh, of course, in the wake of the COVID-19, but, but so much beyond that. There are so many, uh, many uh, uh, challenges uh, in terms of health and healthcare ahead of us that uh, I believe we should, we should do more. And uh, it, it goes very much in, uh, in sync with what we, we discussed earlier. It's not just about, you know, Paris and Boston. It's about the French ecosystem and the American ec ecosystem. And within this American ecosystem, the Midwest has, uh, has a lot to offer. And it is uh, up to us to seize the right opportunities in presenting the right um, interlocutors coming from France. And I sense in my... Uh, uh, preliminary uh, discussions with French partners that there is a lot of excitement about it. So we'll, we'll be working uh, on it. Fantastic. Mr. Consul General, thank you very much for your time. Um, I think you, Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Yes, I think you um, certainly will inspire many people like myself to continue this language and uh, and, and love of France. So I thank you for that and I wish you very good luck going forward. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. 
et c'était un vrai plaisir de pouvoir discuter avec vous. Merci pour vos questions très stimulantes. Merci.